Good morning, all, and welcome to the University of Maryland Medical Systems 7th Diversity Vendor Fair. I'm Donna Jacobs, Senior Vice President for Government, Regulatory Affairs, and Community Health for the University of Maryland Medical System, or UMS. I'll be your program moderator for the start of the program this morning. Uh, let me say that although this is our seventh vendor fair due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the first diversity fair that will be conducted in a completely virtual format. To that end, let me share some logistical information with you before we start. We have a team of people working hard to ensure that this entire day runs smoothly. And that is no easy feat. There are over 350 people registered. If at any time you need assistance, you can contact Riley via the Q&A panel on your screen or our technical helpline at 1-866-799-3000. Three, nine. This event is being recorded, so all participants will be in a listen-only mode throughout the session. Should you wish to read the complete biographies of the speakers or learn more about our MBE program, please visit the Diversity Fair webpage at www.org slash diversity fair. You may also access all of the slides that will be shared today at this event uh, after this session. Our agenda today runs from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. We're starting this morning with greetings from Dr. Mohan Santha, President and CEO of UMS. He'll be followed by Judge Alexander Williams, who is the Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the University of Maryland Medical System Board of Directors. UMS is also pleased to welcome David Zuckerman, the director of the Healthcare Anchor Network uh, this morning. He, the Healthcare Anchor Network is a network of national organizations focused on discerning and promoting the best practices regarding community health and minority business development. Following his address, we'll have a short break and then the UMS hospital CEO panel. At that point, there will be an opportunity to take questions from the audience, should you like to submit some. And if you do, just please type one in the Q&A box, and we'll be happy to take as many questions as we can. From there, we'll move on to more specifics as to how to do business with UMS with a panel of our staff directly responsible for engaging business partners. Vicki Bates, the Director of System Contracting, will moderate that discussion. Over lunch, one of our partners, Tony Hill of Edwards and Hill, will share their experiences with UMS with you. And after lunch, Pat Bizzard, who's the Vice President of Supply Chain Management and Strategic Sourcing, will share some final thoughts for the, uh, and for the rest of the day. And then he'll move us into the, the Diversity Virtual Trade Fair. It's an opportunity to engage and network with UMS staff in a virtual booth. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mohan Santha, my boss. He's the president and CEO of the University of Maryland Medical System. Dr. Santha was selected in November of 2019 to lead our nationally recognized network of academic and community and specialty hospitals, as well as the 150 additional healthcare sites that are part of our system, and the 28,000 dedicated people who work for UMS across this state. Dr. Sunther enjoyed a storied career even prior to taking the helm at the medical system. In reverse chronological order, he served as president and CEO of the University of Maryland Medical Center, the flag flagship academic health center in uh, Baltimore. And before that, from 2012 to 2016, he served as the president and CEO of the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center, where he led that newly acquired hospital from a loss of $72 million in FY13 to profitability in just three years. Dr. Santa started his career 
as a resident in the Department of Radiation Oncology in 1991 at the medical system and developed a national reputation for the management of head and neck and thoracic malignancies. He became the vice chair of the department in 1997 and a tenured professor in 2008. I'm very proud and pleased to bring forward Dr. Mohan Santha. Uh, so thank you, Donna. And uh, I want to say thanks for apparently having my mother write the introduction uh, uh, for you. Uh, but on behalf of the medical system, I want to make sure I, I start by thanking all of you for attending today's virtual uh, fair. The idea of uh, what we are trying to accomplish uh, through efforts like this is to demonstrate who we are as an organization and what our value system is as an organization. As Donna mentioned, I, I've been blessed to step into the role as president and CEO of our health system now a little, uh, a little more than a year ago, a little less than a year ago, I guess, by the time I took the role. And from that point forward, what we as a leadership team have tried to do is to demonstrate by not just our words, but more importantly by our actions, who we are as a health system, what our culture is, and what it is that we value. Uh, this summer, as many organizations and, and many industries around the country uh, held a mirror up to themselves and tried to determine where it is that we as organizations stand on the issues of equity and social justice, we as a health system tried to be quite purposeful in our approach to defining our path forward. And in doing so, we felt very strongly that what we would, we would actually be doing is defining our culture by defining what it is that we value. And as a consequence of leaders across our health system coming together, we asked these leaders to focus on four major work streams that I want to just spend a few minutes describing because my hope is, is that as you hear about our commitments to these four work streams, you'll understand this commitment within the larger context of who we are trying to demonstrate that we are as a health system. I think this is always done uh, in healthcare within the context also of the unprecedented pandemic that we are facing uh, as um, an international healthcare community. And while I am very proud of how the med medical system has acquitted itself so far through this pandemic in demonstrating in all the communities that we are blessed to serve throughout the state of Maryland, that we are a disproportionate healthcare resource to our communities, to our state, to the region, and I would argue to the nation as a consequence of some of the unique partnerships we have with the University System of Maryland. Um, it is also important to understand how important this work is around, again, our commitments to equity and social justice in defining our vision for our health system going forward. Today, our health system is a $4.5 billion a year uh, organization. And as a consequence of being the healthcare organization that actually takes care of the highest percentage of hospital-based healthcare in the state of Maryland, today, we, the University of Maryland Medical System, take, take care of approximately 25% of all hospital-based healthcare in the state of Maryland, with that comes, we believe, unique responsibilities. And so when we talk about these four work streams, the first work stream is being purposeful and looking at the equity of our care delivery. And when we say that, importantly, we are not talking about equity of care through our lens as the healthcare provider, but instead, and perhaps far more importantly, Look at, looking at how our patients and our communities experience their healthcare journeys through their lens is, I think, uh, a necessary step in understanding who we are and how our communities view us as a healthcare organization. So the objective measure of that healthcare experience can be easily done 
uh, if organizations invest the resources to do so. And as we get that information, again, purposefully educating our healthcare workforce on the, con the topics of unconscious bias and how that actually impacts a patient and a family's experience with us is a critical step that we are purposefully taking. The second major work stream is in focusing on our workforce. As Donna mentioned, we are proud that we are a workforce of 28,000 team members strong across our organization. And we're blessed to serve an incredibly diverse community that spans all the way uh, to South and Charles County, to Prince George's County, to Anne Arundel County, to Baltimore City, to the Eastern Shore, up to Hartford County, to uh, Towson, Maryland, et cetera, we serve a wide breadth of geographies. And as a consequence, our workforce, um, the value proposition associated with having a strong and diverse workforce has to be appreciated. An objective place to start is in looking at our leadership team. Today, our leadership team made up of supervisors and above uh, are made up today of 28% people of color. 80% of that 28% are people who self-identify as African American. When I look at, and when we as leaders look at the communities we serve, that number, if we are to reflect the communities that we serve, needs to look more like 40% in order to just be equitable with our communities. And so there is work to be done on how we recruit and how we retain. And that's another significant work stream that we are focused on. The third, and it's very uh, germane to today, is who our partners are. Again, as a $4.5 billion a year health system, we have disproportionate economic power. And we have responsibilities that come with that power. And leveraging that power to strengthen our communities and understanding that having diverse partners actually assigns value, not just to our partners in our communities, but also to us as a health system. And so you're gonna hear quite a bit today about the programs that we are putting in place to strengthen our partnerships with minority-owned businesses, with WMBEs, as a purposeful strategy that, again, defines who we are as a health system and what it is that we prioritize. It's important to recognize that we believe that this value that's associated with this is a value that is assigned not just to us as a system, but to our communities and to our, our partners, such as many of you who are listening and participating in today's vendor fair. Our, our purpose is to grow the top of the funnel make it uh, easier for organizations uh, and vendor partners to understand how do you engage with a health system that is as large and at times as complex as we are as a health system. The fourth work stream is, again, being purposeful with how we deploy our resources when it comes to a commitment to social and economic justice. And so that looks at very purposefully identifying resources that we invest in our communities to address the issues of social determinants of health. And our organization has, has focused on workforce development in our communities and addressing nutritional needs uh, and, the, and the variations that exist within our communities uh, to, in terms of access to healthy nutrition. And that has been a board-sanctioned investment that will be a multiple-year investment. In addition to those investments, uh, our board of the medical system has supported the idea of taking existing investment portfolio and actually placing some of those investments in our communities, place-based investments. Those investments are expected to have a return on their investments for the benefit of the system while also purposefully investing in our community. So across those four work streams, um, my hope is that taken as a collective, this is a way that we as a health system are moving beyond words and moving to action 
that demonstrates who we are and what it is that we value as a unique healthcare resource. Uh, again, in all the communities we serve, in the state of Maryland, in the region, and I argue in the nation, given the size, scale, and reputation of the University of Maryland medical system. So again, I want to say thank you uh, for your participation today. Uh, we have a number of leaders in this organization that you're going to hear from that are my, it is my hope and expectation will echo the sentiments that you've heard from me today. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Donna. Dr. Santa, thank you so much for those words, and I must say that we are certainly uh, very happy with your leadership and with the energy around the EDI initiative. We're grateful to you for all of that. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is the Honorable Alexander Williams, Jr. He's the Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the University of Maryland Medical System Board of Directors. Judge Williams served on the United States District Court for the District of Maryland from September 1994 through January of 2014. Prior to his service on the federal bench, Judge Williams was the chair of the United Set Suburban Sanitation Commission and served as two years for, as the state's attorney for Prince George's County from 87 to 1994. Judge Williams is now a member of the Silverman, Thompson, Slutkin, and White a Baltimore law firm and also conducts mediations and arbitrations with the McCammon Group. He's the chair of the Appellate Judicial Nominating Commission and the founder and CEO of the Judge Alexander Williams, Jr. Center for Education, Justice, and Ethics, a nonprofit policy center which is part of the College of Behavior and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland College Park. I know that Judge Williams was having a little bit of difficulty getting his video up a moment ago, but we should be able to hear him. Judge Williams, please. Yes, uh, Ms. Jacobs, uh, are you able to hear me? We can hear you just fine, Judge. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. For some reason, uh, my computer could not link in, but I'm certainly enjoying what I'm hearing so far. Let me say welcome to this diversity fair. We certainly would have preferred a face-to-face, -face, but this pandemic compels us to move virtually and on this platform. As many of you uh, have now heard, not only has there been new leadership at the top with Dr. something, but the membership of the Board of Directors also has undergone a massive change with new directors of various disciplines and expertise. The Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which I chair, has also seen new committee members with a passion and commitment for support and improvement of our program. We are certainly inspired by the leadership of Dr. Santa and the tone he has set. And UMS is busy implementing a new plan and a new structure developed by Dr. Sumter, which has broadened and expanded the focus, the purpose, and scope of our minority program with a new name, of course, uh, and new core values and culture for diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, UMS is committed to this new focus uh, across the board, and I'm just delighted to be part of it. Now, let me say this. While there has been market success with respect to reaching meaningful goals for minority participation in bidding and in awarding contracts and subcontracting, and in the area of our main concern, which is procurement and purchasing, construction of both major and minor projects, and of course, we also have minorities uh, managing our investment portfolio. Now, certainly there's been, uh, again, uh, progress but there remains challenges and room for improvement across the board. Uh, the members of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee will continue to discharge our responsibility of monitoring and reviewing and reporting on data on both progress and challenges, and certainly we're going to be making recommendations for improvement. Uh, we must recognize that the UMS is a statewide system for the delivery of health care. And we have hospital affiliates, uh, as Dr. Sumter said, in Baltimore, Baltimore County, Hartford County, Eastern Shore, Upper Shore, uh, Anne Arundel County, and Prince George's County. 
in some of these areas, quite candidly, there are too few minority businesses bidding or available for the delivery of services. So we're trying our best to reach out and get uh, more business uh, to minorities. This diversity fair is one of the ways to expand our external partners and to provide notice and access to the list of minority companies and the supply chain. We are continuing to reach out to minority associations and to the Chamber of Commerce and, of course, simply by word of mouth. There are, of course, uh, information, there is information available on our website, and we shall continue to respond to inquiries from the public, including state and local officials who have shown an interest in our minority program. Finally, uh, let me say uh, feel free to contact me or members of the staff at UMS should you have any thoughts or ideas or recommendations for improving our performance on our Minority Business Enterprise Program. So again, uh, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today and enjoy the remainder of this presentation uh, this morning into the afternoon. Judge Williams, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, not only today, but as you do much of the week, um, either on the board or working with and for the board committee. We appreciate your dedication and your, your work with us so very much. Thank you. Well, All right. Our, our next speaker is our keynote speaker today, and that is Mr. David Zuckerman. Mr. Zuckerman is the director of the Healthcare Anchor Network. And as I said a moment ago, the Han, as we refer to it, the Healthcare Anchor Network, is a health system-led collaboration devoted to improving community health and well-being by building inclusive and sustainable local economies. The network currently includes over 50 health systems nat nationwide. His work focuses on inclusive and equitable economic development strategies that build wealth in low-income communities with specific attention on how hospitals and health systems can deploy the business side of their institutions and health systems. Mr. Zuckerman is well published. He's the author of Hospitals Building Healthier Communities, Embracing the Anchor Mission, a contributor to Hospitals Can Heal America's Communities. He's the leading author of a national Academy of Medicine discussion paper entitled Building a Culture of Health at the Federal Level, and he's the co-author of Hospitals Aligned for Healthy Communities. It's a toolkit series. Mr. Zuckerman, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, and I very much appreciate the kind introduction, and I hope that my remarks can build on Dr. Sampa's comments earlier. I think you'll see a lot of alignment between the priorities that you've heard uh, from him regarding UMS' um, priorities moving forward and the work that we're trying to accomplish at the Healthcare Anchor Network. And I hope that in my remarks, perhaps I can just provide some additional uh, na national uh, or context from the national perspective on some trends that we're seeing in healthcare and how they really play out at the local level. And this, this trend that I'm going to mostly be speaking about is what uh, we have come to term the anchor mission of healthcare. And I'll first start by showing a few, uh, few headlines that we've been seeing over the last year. And this one was in the New York Times and the, and the business section, Sunday Times, uh, last year regarding when a steady paycheck is good medicine. And I think that this headline is, is really illustrative of the, sh the shift in, in the narrative in the healthcare sector about what creates good health. We know that quality, uh, good quality and access to care is critically important, but that is insufficient at the end of the day to create communities that are truly able to achieve uh, their, their full health and well-being. And this article looked at how health systems are thinking about leveraging that economic power that we heard Dr. Santa talk about differently to really drive and address the root causes of poor health in their community. Another set of articles that appeared just earlier this year was in Modern Healthcare, which is a prominent trade publication in the healthcare sector. And this looked at a number of different efforts in Cleveland, Ohio, around health systems seeking to build community wealth. 
And community wealth is a, is a lens that we have termed at the Democracy Collaborative and the Health to Anchor Network to think differently about how we do economic development in our communities. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. And just last year, I'm really proud to share that the Healthcare Anchor Network reached a point where we could create a collaborative leadership commitment around impact investment. And I was really excited to hear the, the news that Dr. Santa shared around uh, the board's approval for a similar uh, strategy here at UMS. Uh, this is a really important tool that historically health systems and other anchors, uh, such as universities, have not really deployed and I'm excited for the potential that it'll have in aligning and complementing the other efforts they're already doing and, and, uh, and the other efforts that we continue to see. And so this was an, a leadership commitment that we uh, pushed at the Healthcare Anchor Network, and we're really proud to have a number of our systems make this commitment, not all, but, but a number of them, and really glad to hear uh, around uh, the University of Maryland medical system being part of this going forward. And it really comes down to this understanding of health systems, that they're great at clinical excellence, but they can be making more of an impact. And this relates to the social determinants of health narrative that has become prominent within the healthcare sector over the last decade. And really the deeper understanding around this, the importance of addressing social and economic factors to improve community health and well-being. And for us at the Democracy Collaborative and the Healthcare Anchor Network, we, we take a, a different step back to look at the institution and its resources and how it can be more fully deployed to achieve this shift and improvement in community health and well-being. And for us, anchor institutions are large economic engines within their communities with an embedded social mission that are rooted in place. And the University of Maryland medical system is a clear representative of an anchor institution. Uh, we look at health systems around the country, uh, as you might think also universities are clear anchor institutions, but other organizations that really are nonprofit and uh, public that have grown over time to become the largest economic engines of their communities. I often say that when folks talk about Detroit and the big three, they still think back to the car companies. But today, the largest employers in the city of Detroit are Henry Ford, uh, Wayne, State Medical, uh, Wayne State University and Detroit Medical Center, so two hospitals and a university. Our economies and our communities have shifted, and yet perhaps the path to the middle class is a little bit more obscure than it was 30 to 40 years ago when someone could graduate from high school or not, maybe not even graduate from high school and get a job at the factory down the street. Um, and of course, even then, those opportunities were disproportionately given to certain groups of people in our country. And so as we look at the, how we create more inclusive and local, uh, sustainable local economies today, uh, we have spent a lot of time looking at the role of anchor institutions. And so anchor institutions exist in our communities, but we know that their existence alone does not necessarily entail that they will create economic opportunities for communities that have been most left behind in our country and doesn't necessarily entail that they will have a role in addressing both the racial and economic inequities we see. And for us, that's what's at the heart of the anchor mission, that this intentional commitment that you heard Dr. Sumter refer to regarding how an institution can apply both its long-term place-based economic power, as well as its human capital, the more than 28,000 employees of the institution in partnership with the community to mutually benefit the long-term well-being of both. And that's the vision, that's the aspiration of this concept. And that is what hopefully we are building a, uh, a new narrative around at the Healthcare Anchor Network and doing so nationally with, within the healthcare sector. That is our goal, to, to build this muscle around how institutions can leverage their resources differently. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those strategies that we discuss. Um, and, and the hope that it, it comes, that these different efforts that institutions have been doing historically really come together to become a unified strategy. I'll take a step back and just talk a little bit about our frame at the Democracy Collaborative around community wealth building and how it really is the foundation for this idea of the anchor mission. And for us, we've looked at how economic development has been done historically. And what we see is that it does not reach the communities that need it most. 
It's often focused at the regional level, and it's often focused on bringing businesses to the community that after receiving a benefit often pick up and leave. And so we have really reframed that idea of traditional economic development to community wealth building, which we see looks at different levers around how to keep resources in community and build wealth broadly. And I'll talk about an example of that in a little bit. But the three areas on this screen that I wanna just emphasize that I think contrasts differently with traditional economic development strategies is the importance of place. This is something that has really come to be understood as critical by healthcare systems when they look at how a zip code is more important than one's genetic code in determining their health outcomes. And similarly within community wealth building, we've come to recognize that strategies that will ultimately build inclusive and sustainable local economies have to get down to the zip code and neighborhood level. Another is around ownership. Many of the models that we talk about with with regard to community wealth building are similar to the principles of what we discussed with an anchor institution. An anchor institution is important because it's not going to pick up and leave its community. It is inextricably linked to the well-being, the long-term well-being of the community it resides in. And when we talk about the different models for business development, how also are we creating and investing in new businesses and institutions within the community that will stay there for the long term? And lastly, there's a big emphasis play, placed on multipliers. We know from the research that a dollar spent with a business that is locally owned will keep those dollars circulating in the community. And those businesses were more likely hired from the community. And so it's really important that these are part of the analysis of how institutions make decisions around leveraging their economic resources. And this is what is at the heart of the healthcare anchor network. This is a body of research around anchor institutions that the Democracy Collaborative has done over the last decade. And just four years ago, we brought a number of health systems together to say, should we come together to uh, create a collaboration of how health systems can do this uh, more effectively in their communities? And beyond that, to address the gaps and fill those gaps with different ways of doing this work. For example, can we create a core set of metrics that all health systems can track? Can we come together on issues of policy advocacy? Can we create leadership commitments that would allow those who can to take the next step forward in, in articulating what is the leading edge of this approach in the healthcare sector? Today, there are 53 members of the Health Care Anchor Network and really delighted that uh, University of Maryland Medical System joined us earlier this year. And, and I really want to acknowledge that commitment, even though we are in the midst of a pandemic, to, to acknowledge and note the importance of being part of this conversation around building more inclusive and sustainable local economies. And how do we build back better, frankly, in this moment uh, in which uh, clearly the current state before the pandemic was insufficient for many of our communities. And I think at the end of the day, what we see is the opportunity that even in these 50 health systems in the network, which employ more than 1.5 million people, which is just over 1% of the US workforce, purchase over 50 billion annually, and have over 150 billion in investment assets, that it's not necessarily about shifting every one of these dollars, but that if we can make an intentional commitment to shifting even a small portion of these resources, could we have an even uh, greater impact in the communities we serve? And one of the things we discuss is how does this ultimately create a new aligned strategy across the organization, bringing together departments that historically have not talked to each other, that have not um, come together to discuss how their resources can be leveraged externally. And that is the aspiration with this approach and that we hope is bringing together the many good things institutions were doing into one place and creating that aligned strategy. Some of you in the audience may be asking, why should health systems do this? And I, what I say is that it's really what is necessary if we are going to move the needle on the significant disparities that we see within our communities. This slide in front of you 
is a de depiction of life expectancy in, in Cleveland, Ohio, between the Huff neighborhood, which is predominantly black and mm -hmm. low income, and the Lyndhurst neighborhood, just eight miles down the road, which is predominantly white and affluent. You have a 24 year life expectancy gap. And the reason I put up Cleveland is not because it's, it's not the pick on Cleveland. I like Cleveland a lot. And it's not to say that Cleveland is exceptional. Unfortunately, Cleveland's not exceptional. This is the story in our communities across the country. The reason I put up this slide is because of the fact that the Huff neighborhood, which has the lowest life expectancy of any neighborhood in the entire county is proximate to the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals, two world-renowned health systems. And that's a fact that no one would dispute. Yet clearly, the activities around providing quality care and access to care have not translated into narrowing the disparities that we see in our communities around life expectancy and the quality of life during those years. And if we take a step back even further, we see the underlying issues that, that stretch back uh, a very long time in our country. But this is just a snapshot of the last 50 years and uh, really get at the, the, the comments around social justice that we heard in the opening remarks. That if we look at the difference in lifespan, we've actually widened the gap between the richest and poorest in our country for 13 years and 14 years for women and men, respectively, since the 1970s. Despite long years of efforts on poverty, more Americans live in poverty today than in the early 1970s. And regarding wealth, which we know is an important indicator of resilience during crises, just like this moment in time with the pandemic, that we have a long way to go on the racial wealth gap, and that actually the racial wealth gap is a widening in our country. That the gains that were made before the, the recession 10 years ago were really not, uh, did not narrow in the post-recession period. And the gains that were made in just the last couple of years have been wiped out by the, uh, the pandemic. And so the question becomes is not how can health systems solve all of these issues on their own? That's not possible. But how can they be part of the solution? And that is at the core of the anchor mission of healthcare, because from my perspective, I truly believe that if our institutions in our communities that are committed to place, the committed to uh, improving health and well-being, that are the largest economic engines and employers, are not at the table leveraging all of the resources and bringing others along in the process, that we will not narrow the disparity gaps that we see in our communities around race and economics. And so while our emphasis within the healthcare and network has historically been predominantly on these economic resources of how can health systems think differently about human resources, and we heard about the workforce development efforts that Dr. Sumter really, uh, referred to, supply chain, which is, of course, the emphasis of today's conversation, thinking differently about the opportunities that health systems provide around supply chain. And... Uh, Treasury, which was the place-based investment and impact investment comments that we heard earlier, uh, there has been actually a broadening of the aperture to think about other assets that organizations have that might be able to be tapped unconventionally to further leverage the impact of the institution. Now, one of them that I'll touch on is how large institutions might be able to use their voice differently around policy advocacy. So I'll talk very at a very high level around the strategies that we discuss, um, just to kind of provide a little bit additional context. Uh, one of them that we talk about is around inclusive local hiring and workforce development. And here, the idea is around two components, actually, and, and, and two components that have historically been not linked well, but how could they be linked better around not only the opportunities for health systems and other anchors to provide uh, better access to frontline jobs to uh, communities they serve, but then in the process, building those dedicated ladders internally so that someone who perhaps begins in environmental services could actually make a lateral switch to perhaps uh, beginning the journey around patient care. And we've seen a few health systems uh, begin to build these ladders 
internally to allow for a more uh, a, a more intentional approach to family supporting wage positions. Because as I noted at the beginning, the pathway to family supporting wage positions do run through our anchor institutions, yet the path is a little less clear today than it might have been 30 to 40 years ago. The other strategy that we heard referenced already was around place-based invest investing. And health systems, have to, nonprofit health systems, have to do community benefit. Um, and that is one resource they can provide. But place-based investment really looks at the investment portfolios that health systems also have to maintain in order to invest in their organizations long term. And you can think of it as equivalent to the endowments that universities have. And there, maintain, there is an opportunity there to think differently about how some of those resources, instead of being invested on Wall Street in stocks and bonds, can be used to create socially responsible returns in their own, in their own communities and also uh, achieve a small return for the institution. So it's not about granting those resources, it's about just leveraging those resources differently in terms of patient capital within the communities they serve. And to address things like affordable housing or uh, working with other lending institutions that provide capital to support minority and women-owned businesses or other local businesses. Uh, I, I can speak from my own experience as my role as the treasurer of a foundation down in D.C. where we work with uh, WACEF, which is a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, that uh, provides capital to minority-owned businesses within the city of D.C. And, and the DMV area. And that this is an area where we have ourselves uh, put an impact investment or provided capital. So it gives it an opportunity for those dollars to be invested locally to address many of the challenges that we see uh, within our own, our own ecosystems and our own local communities. And then I talked about uh, policy day. Uh, or about policy advocacy. And this was another no, uh, new effort by the Healthcare Anchor Network, and, and we think that one of the first such efforts in the healthcare sector to bring together more than 20 systems to the Hill, just meet with their congressional representatives and uh, advocate for the most critical, uh, most critical resources around affordable housing nationally. As I said, there's a lot that institutions can do but we also know policy is needed to address the systemic inequities within our communities. And that adding policy advocacy to the agenda helps to complement the individual activities that health systems and other anchors are leading locally and in partnership with other anchors in the community. And together this helps create an all-in approach that I believe will have much more impact long-term on moving the needle on the challenges we face. Lastly, I'll just talk about inclusive local sourcing given the focus of today's um, event. The two strategies we often talk to our partners about are on creating connections and building capacity. This event is clearly about creating connections. And I want to applaud UMS for holding it and for making this commitment despite it having to move to a virtual format. Um, this is something that when I meet with other systems, I actually have to talk to them about doing. It's not something that's commonplace, and we want to make it more commonplace. We want to make it the norm. The second is around building capacity. And I'll talk about an example of work that we actually did in Cleveland around helping build capacity uh, for a new set of businesses that would provide goods and services to the institution. Now, the Democracy Collaborative uh, used to be headquarters in Cleveland. And we were, and the primary reason for that was that our, in, about a decade ago, we supported Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals along with Case Western Reserve University on a project uh, to help them think through how they can ident identify gaps in their supply chain and uh, build capacity for new businesses to support and meet those gaps. And that process became known as, or that, that project became known as the Evergreen Cooperatives. And the, the two photos in the middle um, are with the two employees. Are, you can see are two of the businesses that were developed. One was a one of the largest urban uh, scale greenhouses in the country, and the other was a commercial scale laundry. 
And what was novel about these businesses that was that in addition to be cited within the communities that these organizations serve uh, and with a dedicated uh, mission to hire from the, those neighborhoods uh, that I showed earlier, the Huff neighborhood in Cleveland, they were also going to be uh, greenest in class and employee owned. So in addition to uh, having a wage that provided health care, at the end of the year, any profits created by these businesses were distributed to the workers. And this was this 10 years later, these businesses employ more than 200 people. Um, and just last year, the Cleveland Clinic moved its entire laundry operation to the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, which was a really exciting development. And so I share this as an example of how we're seeing innovation across the sector in terms of different ways to not only create connections, but also build capacity and invest in the communities these institutions sit in for the long term. Thank you. Oh, to, to conclude my remarks, I just to say, I, I, I hope that uh, the, the takeaway is that what we're seeing nationally is this concept moving from individual departments to an organizational strategy. And I think that the potential is really powerful for not only addressing the historical inequities that we see, the racial inequities, the economic inequities, but to also creating more vibrant local communities in the process and ultimately improving health and well-being for the communities these institutions serve. So thank you again for the invitation to share with you about this work and really excited to follow UM's journey on, on, on their anchor mission. Sorry for jumping in so quickly, but thank you so much for those comments. They were really helpful. And if you are able, David, can you take a question or one question in the two minutes that we have left? Sure. Uh, so we really appreciate that, and we do just have two minutes. Can you, from your experience, perhaps share or give some advice from uh, what you've seen in terms of how hospitals and health systems, not just UMS, but all, might be able to work together with the local communities that they serve for some action items to help increase minority business development? Are there a couple of things that just come to mind right off the bat? Well, I think one of the things that's really critical is the work that institutions do internally to, to actually prioritize and incentivize and create the time and space for uh, staff to to not only uh, identify the businesses that exist in the ecosystem but also think about ways that they can build the capacity for them and then also i think the broader table of how institutions can come together to do things at scale that might not make sense for any one institution to do alone for example it would have been unlikely that any one institution would have helped to uh, do this commercial scale laundry but by aggregating demand and by working with the city, by working with uh, the large community foundation, uh, by leveraging federal resources, they were able to uh, commit to buying from this organization if it met their needs at, you know, at the price and quality that was expected of the institutions, but to also embed into the conversation this lens around equity, sustainability, and community wealth building. And I think that's the shift that I would encourage, which is how in the course of doing business, do we not lose sight of the opportunity that certain decisions may present to add these additional lenses, uh, you know, and, 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 and to couple uh, different activities? You know, we're right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? Uh, later today, actually, I will uh, be hosting a summit with, um, with supply chain leaders from across the country. And in that conversation, we will be talking about the discussion around localization of PPE or onshoring PPE. How in that process of this critical opportunity of thinking about diversifying our, um, our, our vendors, do we think about doing so in a way that might also support the city of Baltimore and or the other communities that I'm um, serve? Um, you know, if we're relocating a distribution center, uh, one system that I talked with, I remember saying, we asking a partner to, to bring that distribution center closer to a community that they knew was in need of jobs. And so I think it's about bringing that additional lens to the conversation. And that starts internally with how an institution is um, prioritizing the conversation, 
But then ultimately, there's, I think, an opportunity for um, an institution that's leading on this conversation to expand that out. And, and the one example I would give as a case in point of this is uh, Rush University Medical Center on the west side of Chicago. They, they were all in on this approach. And they, through their leadership, brought along the other seven institutions on the west side of Chicago to, um, to make shared commitments around hiring, supply chain, and impact investment for that community, and then took another step further to help uh, stand up a broader community collaboration that would help, uh, that has set the goal of trying to narrow the life expectancy gap between uh, the, the loop, which is the downtown neighborhood, and the west side of Chicago. So I think, I think working at those different levels, all are needed. And so it, it is about creating, I think, a new table that historically has not existed, or when it did exist, might have been uh, a table that wasn't for everybody. And I think institutions, not, uh, uh, especially anchors, nonprofit and public institutions, have an opportunity to create a new table and a new way of doing business. Uh, that will serve Baltimore and, and, and the other communities that I'm served uh, well into the future. Thank you so much. We are so very appreciative of all of your comments and the time that you've spent. There's one good thing about virtuals, we could get you here uh, today with us. So thank you much. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now have a short break. We will resume at 10 o'clock. And when we do, we'll move forward with the UMS Hospital CEO panel. See you back in just a few minutes. You may leave your lines open if you like so you don't have to rejoin. Thank you so much. <laughs>